Okay, comrade. The Russian nightmare that get a call off here. Tune in and listen to the undisputed wrestling show. I tell your stinking head right off your body. But nonetheless, uh, both of us were rebooked for a loop in Rhode Island and uh, New Jersey, I think. And Sammy was from there at the time. So they flew me in, and then we rode together. And he got the dark match on Monday night. And this is Providence, Ro- I'm sorry, this is SmackDown, and this was in Providence, Rhode Island. And he went out there for his dark match, and three quarters of the crowd knows who he is and is enchanting for him. <laughs> so you tell me, are you going to invest the long-term success of your company in a guy who's seven foot tall and looks amazing and may or may not be able to pass a wellness test? Or are you going to give a guy an opportunity who busted his ass like Sammy did to get over on a national indie level to the point where when they throw him out there in a dark match, more of the crowd knew him than they knew Fandango. <laughs> so obviously, you know, it, it's a fundamental shift, and I think it's phenomenal. And I think it's, it's going to only help the business because at the end of the day, the cream will always rise to the top. And if they're starting to look at guys that have been holding their crafts for 10 years independently, what does that tell you about the talent pool five to 10 years from now? You know, the business is cyclical. My only regret in this whole thing was that that fundamental shift of philosophy didn't happen in my late 20s to early 30s instead of my mid-30s. Does that make sense? Because it only creates another obstacle for me. But at the same time, I'm glad that what I perceived as an injustice while I was calling my way through an opportunity, I'm glad that that's been righted now. And I think the business is going to prosper. It has to. Otherwise, you know, MMA is doing pro wrestling better than pro wrestling right now. So if there's going to be a professional wrestling industry in 10 years, it needs to adapt and it needs to evolve like every other business. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Now, speaking of evolving, you know, of course, uh, the big thing on on Facebook world and in social media right now is the whole tough enough submissions and stuff. And for any of our listeners, if you watched the last WWE pay-per-view and stuff, uh, especially the pre-show, you might have seen some of your favorite indie stars uh, and their tough enough submissions. Now, Ali, I'm going to ask you, how do you feel uh, when, you know, companies like WWE has a tough enough submission or when TNA had their gut check and stuff? Uh, do you feel like these are legitimate concepts that they're actually searching out for talent? Or do you think this is just a way for WWE, TNA, et cetera, to drum up interest in their business? I think it's both. But I think they'd be crazy if they didn't see somebody who was worth money on one of these audition tapes and they didn't give them an opportunity. I think, and I say that for for two reasons. Number one is, yeah, it's a tremendous tool because now their WWE universe gets to get interactively involved with the product. That's pretty amazing. That didn't happen 30 years ago. So that's another example of their business model evolving to the current time. Um, Do I think people will get opportunities? Absolutely. Some of my best friends had some really awesome, tough enough audition tapes and were trending in the top 10 for WWE's list. Uh, Michael Hayes' video was awesome. Uh, uh, Joe Coleman's video was fantastic. Uh, the Blossom Twins did a parody that WWE Tough Enough retweeted today. Uh, so I think it's an opportunity for a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise get uh, a look to be able to to share in that spotlight that is WWE. You know, you may not know a guy like Joe Coleman, but you know WWE Tough Enough. And if you see WWE Tough Enough and you see Joe Coleman cut a promo and you see that he's, you know, a genetic jackhammer or whatever he calls himself, uh, maybe your awareness of him increases. So maybe if he did a good enough video, uh, I know Dylan Bostic at like 70-something thousand views in less than a week for his video. Mike Hayes is right behind him at 66,000 views. These are potentially... 55 to 60,000 people that didn't know either of these guys last week. And they're obviously wrestling fans because why else would you be watching a Tough Enough video? <laughs> so maybe in two years when Dylan Bostic gets put into the ring with a guy that already has a job and all the people are chanting his name or booing at him because they know who he is because of opportunities like Tough Enough, how is that a bad thing? You know, they may not turn around and hire you. T- they may not hire you today for Tough Enough because you're Tough Enough video. But I guarantee you, if you show them something in that video, you'll get on the radar. And that's all you can ask for, is to get on the radar and develop a relationship with the company. I know if they need now, a six-foot-tall Persian guy, I know who they're going to call. Probably <laughs> probably Davari's brother, but nonetheless, I'll be sitting <laughs> right for that. Hey, <laughs> hey I, need to, I need to call a timeout real quick. 
Dylan Bostick has never been on our show. I've met him, and he's a great guy. But you're putting him over, and a couple weeks ago, Gregory Iron was putting him over. He is the most uh, talked-about guy on our show that's never been on. So that's – you can go well, back you to guys, that point. Listen, you guys, he has like 60,000 Twitter followers. So Dylan Bostick, uh, not that that's uh, a basis for me to put him over, but that shows <laughs> you that he's been traveling a lot and that people know who he is. He's got an awesome look. I met Dylan when he was like an awkward, geeky, like 18, 19-year-old kid. And I I saw this guy pay his dues. I saw him go to Rip's class for two and a half years straight, living on Jesse Goddard's couch without a pot <laughs> to piss in. And to see how he developed his body, he's growing into a man now. And to see the success and to see him going places and to know that he's doing well because he learned the solid fundamentals and how to get over in a territory, then going to weekly spot shows is a piece of cake. And I'm super glad that he – I would love to see Dylan Bostic and Mike Hayes and uh, Joe Coleman cast on something. I would love to see those three guys. I'm sure they'll find some uh, equally deserving people. But for me personally, I'd like to see those guys. So, you know, yeah, I think it's a thing. And, you know, I, I know guys that have been on Tough Enough. I'm friends with them. And uh, some of them didn't win. Some of them did. But it was still a launching pad for their career. Uh, a couple of the TNA gut checkers are friends of mine. Th- that was an opportunity that they would not have had if TNA didn't want to fill a segment or two with this gut check concept, you know? And forever, uh, Alex Silva can call himself the first ever gut check winner. It doesn't matter if gut check was a rib or it doesn't matter if it never went anywhere. He's got a title that he can market himself with now and he got a year and a half of paycheck. <laughs> so, you know, who at the end of the day won? So, whether or not they're going to hire a guy and then push him immediately out of tough enough, I don't know. But at the same time, I hope they don't because that never works out real well. Now, one more question uh, before I pass it back to Zane and stuff. Uh, me, myself, I, I consider you a veteran. You've been doing this for years. Uh, and you're definitely at the top of one of the premier uh, professional wrestling companies, not only in uh, America but in the world. So when you're at training um, or you're at a show and a green guy comes in, uh, about how long does it take before you click, before it clicks your mind whether or not this guy has it uh, or this guy's going to make it in this business? And if you feel like this guy doesn't can't make it in the business, uh, do you ever go over there and tell the guy, like, listen, hey, I don't think this is for you. Maybe you should try something else. No. I, well, I'll say that I am, uh, I am very quick to judge based on someone's etiquette upon first meeting them. And that doesn't necessarily mean their interaction with me. I think you can tell a lot about somebody based on their body language. So putting that into context, um, I have seen literally probably well over a thousand guys come and go through OVW in 10 years. Uh, there are guys that come in the right way. There are guys that don't. And then there are guys that come in the totally wrong way. Uh, and, you know, you just treat them accordingly. I would never go to somebody and say, you will never make it. You need to quit. Because some of the people that you least likely thought would get over got over. Does that make sense? Like, oh, definitely. Daniel, Daniel Bryan comes to mind on a national stage, but in OVW, I saw countless guys that most would have written off as a goof that ended up doing something in the business because they devoted themselves. Like, okay, for instance, Dylan Bostic is, by nature, an extremely arrogant kid, <laughs> and he can rub you off. He can rub you the wrong way if you don't know him and you don't know that he's working a gimmick 24-7. <laughs> so, Despite having a poor first impression, uh, I realized and I saw the passion in this guy. There's a difference between guys who show up for TV and then guys who go to TV, go to class, go to all the spot shows, and are continuously evolving their craft. If you're in the same spot you were two years ago, whether it's at the same show or at the same level on the same show, or whether you've developed any new sh- tool sets or whatnot, then that's kind of complacency. And, and OVW is a training school. First and foremost. So in that training environment, if you're not somebody who's an established pro who doesn't already have a name or has a body of work or a certain level of knowledge, and I don't think anybody's in a position to validate themselves as being in that position, but if you treat it like it's, you know, a second priority, then I'm going to treat you like a second priority. And that was especially true when I was writing the show. And that was a thousand percent true when it came to whose matches I agented on the show. Because if you had a good attitude and you were the shits, 
I made it my mission to make you look good so that I could brag and say, I'm mine behind that match. <laughs> but, <laughs> honestly, why, why, you know, it's again, it's do you know your stuff? I, like I said earlier, I, I've done this so often with people that I had never met that I know I can wrestle anybody. But can you agent a match for two guys that are severely limited but by virtue of their physical gifts are on top of the card and are expected to do 20 minutes as the main event of a Saturday night special? Can you agent those guys to success? Now, I'm not a proponent of walking people through matches. I would prefer to call everything in the ring. In television, I would like to have a finish and what the business is, obviously, but everything else is going to get called in the ring. But if you have two guys that look like the Hulk and they're so green that they don't know what to do and you can literally craft a match as if you were a big man your entire career and have it believably go off and then have the boss go, who agented that match? And you can raise your hand. I mean, that's, come on, boys. That's, that's a, a feather in your cap. And that's not necessarily, that didn't necessarily happen every time, believe me. But <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's the goal that you strive for in that position. Does that make sense? And your, your oh, mind yeah. is actively, your mind is actively working. I make no mistake that 20 minute mass was out of my brain. So seeing it executed was still a learning experience for me and how to coach guys. And I didn't have to go out there and do the 20 minute mass myself. So in a way, it's more of a valuable learning experience than being the actual performer because it forces you to also look at what people's strengths and their weaknesses are from a booking standpoint and from an agent standpoint. And if you can identify that, then you can very easily identify that as a performer and make sure that whether your job is to be the heel or the baby face, you, you get it done. Then you have any other Sorry, questions I'm drinking, for the... I'm, I'm drinking my herbal tea, guys. That's why there's such a uh, long pause sometimes between my diatribes. Just... <laughs> <laughs> this is a disputed wrestling show. We are talking with the Ohio Valley Wrestling Heavyweight Champion, Muhammad Ali Baez. And, uh, Ali, we, where did you say that, that you were from originally? I, I know you're of Persian descent, but, but where did you grow up? Well, I was born in a trailer park in eastern Kentucky, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but my, uh, and that is a, that is a true story. How many Muhammads you know that were born in the trailer park in Eastern Kentucky? But, uh, my parents moved to Richmond, Kentucky to go to Eastern Kentucky University in 1980 when I was about 10 months old. And I grew up literally until I was 18 years old and went to West Point. I grew up in Richmond, Kentucky. So I've lived in Kentucky almost my entire life, minus four years that I spent in college up in New York. Okay, you had mentioned New York earlier, so so one of my questions was going from New York to uh, Louisville, but no, that that's where you're from. That's you're born and bred there, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the whole reason I moved to Louisville was because I knew OVW was in Louisville. Uh, I got out of the army in 2001, and uh, it's this is one of literally the biggest regrets of my life is I wanted to go to OVW immediately, which was 2002, and instead I went to graduate school and I got a master's degree. And uh, then I moved to Louisville. And at this point, I had already been uh, doing indie wrestling for a year on and off. Uh, so I got to Louisville, and I was acclimating myself, and I was getting ready to go to OVW. And then I saw the debut of Muhammad Hassan. And then I kicked myself in the ass, because I knew if I had done what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, that there is a at least somewhat of a possibility that I could have been on that stage because I spoke the exact same language as the Vari. So nonetheless, well, you, Louisville you, you is my destination. Yeah, that's true. That is definitely true. You can't, and I wish I had a crystal ball. But nonetheless, I ultimately ended up in Louisville because I, I was aware of WWE's affiliation with OVW. So I purposely moved here in order to immerse myself. And once they left, uh, like I already alluded to, I saw the opportunity that existed within the organization here, and that's why I stayed. Now, are you are you familiar with a uh, hardcore band down uh, in Louisville uh, called Bader Bomb? Yes, I am. I believe they tweet me hateful messages all the time. Well, what, why are they doing that? Well, listen, see, here's the thing. is uh, uh, Right now, I am uh, doing somewhat of a religious uh, gimmick. And uh, they just have, happen to be fans of Eddie Diamond, uh, my current challenger, and uh, they just go out of their way to uh, talk smack all the time. I, I guess they have uh, something against fundamentalist right Christians who twist religion into a way to manipulate people. I don't know. 
Well, I, I'm from Indiana, and, and Jones was originally from Indiana. That's where he started his started his church. So uh, maybe 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 you need to read up on him a little bit more. Definitely, you cut out though, so I didn't hear his name. Who who was that? Oh, Jim Jones. Jim Jones is he? A, oh, oh yeah, Jim Jones. Yes, yes, yes. I watched a documentary about him actually recently. You are talking about the cult leader, correct? Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, absolutely. He was definitely uh, an inspiration. I, if I could talk about this uh, this gimmick right now, like I literally, this is something that I wrote myself, and the reason I wanted to do this is uh, twofold. Number one, I firmly believe, at least in my interpretation of the art of professional wrestling, is it's a series of opening and closing various stories. Whether that's through physical moves or through the actual art of uh, long-term storytelling, that's my interpretation of uh, wrestling. And when I came into OVW, I came in as a fundamentalist Islamic radical. So I could think, uh, character-wise, not as a real person, <laughs> so I could think <laughs> of no better way to close that circle than to go 180 degrees the opposite way and to do the fundamentalist evangelical uh, end of days is coming Whatnot, but it's moreover also a uh, commentary on the fact that you know I, I got nothing against religion, and I've, I've specifically been very careful to not call out Christianity or any of that. I, I'm not interested in offending people's religious beliefs, and that's truly not the intent behind the gimmick that I'm doing. Moreover, is I want to tell a story of someone who's taking religious belief and twisting it for their own benefit which is, I think, a much higher level character than put this towel on your head and go out there to this Islamic music because they hate everybody from there right now. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, definitely. So well, uh, Will he, uh, is is doing a, a thing where he's running for president. So it sounds like he's doing politics, what you're doing uh, with religion Absolutely. right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to say that, like, The Daily Show isn't a huge influence on my decision to take my character this way would be doing uh, John Stewart a uh, disservice because I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, and, uh, man, I just, it, you see it play out so often, too, from, like, the, and I, again, I don't want to put on Christianity, but you see, like, the, the Catholic priests who are abusing the boys. And again, that's someone taking the trust of a religious person and then them using it in an evil way. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you see the the guys that grow up in the Middle East that have no hope for future and all that kind of stuff. So somebody tells them that God loves them if they go blow somebody up and then they do it. I mean, that's, again, the exact same thing. Twisting religion in order for someone to get an unfair advantage and or control of society. I just so happen to be tied to tell a version of that story in a squared circle. Well, very you know, nice. that's so, you know uh, Ali, that's so funny because I look at politics basically the same way, um, which is why I'm doing the whole political gimmick right now. You know what I'm saying? That, the fact that I have, like, probably the greatest political name ever, you know, William Huckabee sounds like a politician from the South. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, would, I would put your campaign sticker on my car right now. <laughs> Well, I'm getting them made, actually, they're being shipped to the house this week, so I'll actually uh, message you on Twitter and stuff and get your address and send you some. Yeah, definitely, please, man. I I will. I will tweet that bitch out on the bumper of my car. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Muhammad Ali Baez, we are almost out of time. What would you uh, – well, please share your social media information again so our listeners can follow your career. And uh, what what else would you like to say to your fans that are listening right now? Uh, well, you can follow me on Twitter at Ali underscore Viez. Uh, I'm under Facebook under Muhammad Ali Viez, uh, and I'm on Instagram. Man, I get confused with all these handles. Just look up Muhammad Ali Viez. There aren't very many of us out there. <laughs> uh, and on YouTube as well. Uh, and to anybody that's ever paid a ticket to watch me perform or anybody that has ever seen, uh, me, whether it's live in person or on video, thank you. Uh, and, uh, man, I, I love wrestling, man. That's all I can say. So, uh, whether I'm, uh, whether I'm doing this on regional television or whether I'm working somewhere behind the scenes or whatever, I, I can firmly say that, uh, I have a feeling that this business will unfortunately and fortunately be a part of my life for the foreseeable future. Well, and I, I gotta let you know our, uh, producer, Killa Kev, who is, is a little shy to speak on, on the air tonight. He's a huge fan of yours and, he was very excited. Listen, I, I know Kevin is one of the first guys I met in the wrestling business. What? Mount, yeah. What? Yeah. No. 
Yes, and he's over there kayfabing the whole time. Uh, but oh. I'm pretty sure, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I met him for the first time in Mount Sterling, Kentucky in 2004 for the Mountain Wrestling Association. Can you, can you corroborate that for me? Yes, you are correct. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I honestly have, like, huge blank spots at moments of my career, but I very distinctly remember Kevin Keel. <laughs> How could you not? I look just about exactly like Mick Foley, and everybody reminded me of it every day. So, <laughs> And that's exactly why I remembered. And that's why I didn't, I purposely didn't call you Foley. I purposely didn't call you Foley. Because the first time I met you, you introduced yourself as Foley. Well, because if I introduced myself as, you know, Kevin Fields, nobody'd know who the hell you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Hey man, it's it's a gimmick. Nobody ever refers to Mick Foley as Foley, do they? Everybody says Mick Foley or Cactus Jack or Dude Love. There's no Foley. <laughs> but there is a Foley. And I met him in two thousand four in Mount Sterling. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ali, thank you so much for coming on tonight, and thank you for uh, for sharing a little bit of insight into uh, Kevin Fields there, or or how we're not going to call him Killa Kev anymore. He's going to be Foley for the rest rest of the time here. So, Listen, if, if I, I hope I'm not burying myself with you, uh, Kevin, if I just reopen some painful wounds from uh, 11 years ago. Oh no, no, it's there. there there's nothing painful about it. Okay, I don't want the reputation of being a bully. I just want to make that clear. But but I but I will just say this since we are on the air. What, I've been looking to get you on one of our shows here literally for years because when I first met you and got to know you personally and then saw what you were doing in the ring and you were only out of rest you'd only been in wrestling really about a year year and a half then and you were still going to school down at EKG, right? Yes, yes, and and I well, I was really just training. I wasn't actually working shows. You know, just uh, trying to get ring work wherever I could. I mean, at that time, I could see you you were going to go a lot further. No, no joke, going a lot further than most of your other peers at that time. Either you know, right there in in the organization, or you know, that had the same level of experience as you. And it has honestly been a real pleasure getting to watch you work your way through the business over the years and where you're at now. And I'm I'm just really happy that you, they finally put the big belt on you. Oh, thank you, man. It only took me nine years to earn it. Uh, oh. And I had to uh, I had to convince them through eight other television title reigns that I was worthy. But, man, a lot of it is, is really, it's just like the business itself, man. It's right place, right time. And I was always the guy that made the guy. And that was a role that I wanted because the heel controls the ring. And when the heel controls the ring, the heel's telling the story. So it wasn't in my cards. Actually, two times it was in my cards that they were going to put the big belt on me. And one time I was cast on a reality show, and I gave them three days' notice. And then I ended up uh, not getting my plane ticket. And somebody else was written in and took that spot. So that was real bittersweet uh, to realize that they had the faith in me two, three years ago uh, to put that spot in me. So it's what? nice to have it, don't get me wrong. And uh, it's definitely, in the back of my mind, you always want to be the guy that the company can rely on. I think it's uh, it speaks highly for you and your value to the organization. So for me, I mean, I didn't care about being the champ so I could wear the belt. It was more for me a validation of what I contributed to the company during my tenure there, if that makes sense. Right. What was the reality show? Man, what wasn't the reality show, dude? I've been cast on five of them in the last six years, uh, and you've never seen me on one, have you? No, uh, no. The reality show business is more carny than wrestling, dude. Uh, in this particular <laughs> incident, this particular reality show was the third one that I had been cast on, and it was a Discovery Channel show, and the premise was you would be in groups of four, and you would have to do, like, extreme challenges and rappel out of helicopters and bullshit like that, and then they would drop you off and you have to use survival skills. Uh, and I caught a promo in OVW, and I was in one of the, like, the best shades of my life at the time. But I, I did a promo for him at OVW, and I talked about my West Point background and uh, that I had air assault school and airborne school, and I had all these qualifications from the military, and also I could be an entertaining personality, because I was a total dick heel in the promo. 
So they loved it. They cast me. I had to fill out a bunch of nonsense. I had to have my lawyer look at it. Uh, and then they told me, we're going to send you travel, make plans to be in L.A. because you got to do, like, psychological evaluation to make sure you're not crazy. And then you got to take, like, a bunch of tests to make sure you don't have AIDS or Ebola or whatever. So that was going to take place on Thursday. OVW TV was taping Wednesday. I didn't know what was written for the show. And I told the booker, hey, I have a plane ticket and I have to be in California on Tuesday. So the company yeah. did what they had to do, and somebody else got the spot. So, but nonetheless, I mean, the person that got the spot was equally deserving at the time, and I don't want to stooge him off uh, just by virtue of the story. But uh, nonetheless, that's a roundabout way of saying, uh, yeah, man, wrestling, it can be heartbreaking. But reality shows, at least I love wrestling. Reality shows are just nothing but a headache for me. Man. Yeah. And I never made a dollar in reality shows. Never made a dollar. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show with us, Ali. Very much appreciate it, and I have just been vastly entertained all night. Thank you. Ah, thanks, man. I appreciate you shouting me out, Kevin, and uh, getting me on the show, man. And guys, it's been a blast. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking wrestling, so it was by no means an exercise in futility for me. At least. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it so much. Everybody hit him up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, Muhammad Ali Vayas, thank you so much for being on tonight. All right, guys. Take it easy.